guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 206, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. William Volk. This part of the interview, Bill and I chat about Return to Zork in the adventure game genre, the past, present, and the future. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Bill Volk. Well, I got here in 1983, you did some work on Universe. I think that's an uh, Omni Trim. I, I, what happened there is I did a fourth graph system. I was using fourth by then, fourth programming language, which is a rather obscure language. Like when you add two numbers, you go like three, four, plus, dot, and that, that results in this answer of uh, six would appear on the screen. That's how fourth worked. Reverse pulse notation, stack based language. So I had done something in 81 for Atari called fourth Turtle Graphics Plus, where I replicated the logo. Total graphics system for the Atari programming exchange for their fourth language. And then I did something with a company called Voyager Graphics in Arizona, which is still in business. Voyager is still no, is, it, no, is it Voyager? No, it's um, Valpar. Valpar International. V A L P A R. Valpar International in Arizona had a fourth programming system for the Atari 100 called Valforth. And this is where things get very complicated because what I did is I wrote a turtle graphics system for them called Val World, Val, Val Graphics. And then I did a 3D wireframe system called Val World. And what Universe did is they used the Val World system to build a game. I had no thing else to do with that. And I didn't even know they did that until almost 15 years later. It wasn't until I saw it in Moby Games that I had a credit in that game that I realized I had a credit in the game. Because I had just written the stuff for Val Par International. Where this gets crazy is Val Par International has nothing to do with Valdox, where I go to in 1982. Um, at the end of 82, I go to Val, I go to Val to work on Valdox, which is also using Fork, but they have no relation whatsoever. Just the name is similar. It's, every, it's confusing to think about it. And with Valdox, the thing I do that's, that I most am proud of is something called Valdraw, which was a 50K CAD package where you could draw shapes and stuff, lot, vectors, lines, and, and, and put in dimensions with numbers on it. And, uh, and it would like display fractions. It would display like five and three quarters. And you could change the size of things. The dimensions were recalculated and it had layers and it had multiple views and it supported all these plotters. And it ran in 50 kilobytes. It was, I have a book with the code in it. And I look at the code and I go, how did I do it? Like, for example, the font was a drawn font. So the letter A was drawn like do, 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 right? Lines. So the letter could be rotated. It could be scaled. This is in 1984, 83, 84. I actually stored each line draw as a byte. Four, uh, four bits for Y, three bits for X, one bit for pen up or pen down. That's it. And it, everything was done that way. That game, that thing was packed small as it could be and it was a really good package i understand rising star which owned it made money off of it and it was um i could i couldn't do that again if i wanted to i don't know how i did it and then of course when the mac came out i fell in love with the mac left aegis i mean left um out of line, uh rising star and co-formed aegis development which became one of the largest amiga publishers i did two games for aegis and then i i was mainly focused as being the vice president of development and one of the games we publish which I, I think is, was certainly a clue about where everything was going to happen on Facebook. And that was called Ports of Call, done by two Germans, Rolf Dieter Klein and Martin Ehrlich. And oh, Ports I love of Call, that game. Played the hell out of that game. Yeah, Ports of Call was originally an Aegis title. And here's how lucky I am. I am the luckiest man in the world. Because who picks up Ports of Call after Aegis goes out of business? A little guy named, with a little company, and a guy named this name, a guy named Bobby Kodak. Bobby Kodak is in the Amiga world at the time. He knows who I am. He picks up Ports of Call, and years later, when he buys Active, gets control of Activision, he knows who I am. So I can talk to Bobby and say, "Hey, I got some really cool stuff going on with this digital video and, and this adventure game engine. You should, you should, do, we should do this." And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, you should do that." Otherwise, I would have left Activision, like everyone, like pretty much every, everyone did in '92 when Activision reorganized under Bobby. So uh, it all relates to Ports of Call, it all relates to Aegis and the Amiga. Lucky, 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 lucky. So um, yeah, Ports of Call, in, in, nine, in 2003, and this is on SlideShare, 
I did a presentation on in Korea on the future of games. And I what I said was a game like Ports of Call, if you played it, you remember what it was like. You basically start with a little bit of cash, you buy the cheapest ship you can, and you run cargoes around the world trying to get the best deals to get more money to buy more ships. And I said in 2003, this little presentation I did on the future of games in Korea, that if you took this game and you put it on the network and you had people playing it, you'd have a virtual world economy and you, the game itself would run by itself. So you'd set ships off and you'd get messages when the ships got to where they got. And I basically, that was the model for everything that happened on Facebook with Farmville and the rest. And Ports of Call did that in the 80s on a turn-based game on the actual Amiga. So yeah, I love Ports of Call. Yeah, Ports of Call is cool. So, you know, you said you love the Macintosh, but you also love the Amiga. I'm just kind of wondering what, you know, well, the Amiga how, was how do you compare the those two? Well, it's interesting because of the 8-bit error of computers. I love the Amiga. I spent $1,200 of my own money in the summer of 80 to buy an Amiga 800 with, with 48 kilobytes of RAM, a floppy drive, the serial interface, and Star Raiders. I love Star Raiders. I actually worked at a video store in New Hampshire when I was at UNH and we had a projection TV, big screen TV, and we'd hook up Star Raiders and when no one was in the store, we'd play Star, Ra Star Raiders all day long. That game sold me on the system. So the I never got to know the Commodore 64, so I assume the C64 was actually better in some ways in hardware, but I loved the hardware on the uh, Atari. There were so many cool things about it, I mean, and it was a cool machine. The other cool machine of the era was the Coco. Uh, the, Tandy Coco. I love the Tandy Coco. Simple, fast, better CPU than the Atari. Um, just a nice little machine, cheap machine. Um, what was cool about the Mac in 84 was the whole UI thing. The fact that they had this great operating system with cool graphics commands built into it. And they have this mouse based interface. And yes, it was black and white. Yes, it was primitive. But it was just, it seemed to me like a real possibility. And, you know, the Pyramid Peril was. Great, but when I my seminal moment on the Mac was in 1988, I got to Activision. The first week I'm there, there's a box, a blue box, I remember the color of five floppies sitting on the VP's desk, Dick Lairberg's. And in that disc is a game he had picked up at a show, a hypercar title called The Manhole. And what the Cyan guys had done, ran around Miller, that no one had figured out is they had no interface, Manhole had no buttons no arrows, nothing. It was, there's a scene, you click on it and see what happens. And it was like, why didn't we think of this? I, I think back to Pyramid of Peril. Pyramid of Peril would have been so much better if I had a full screen display and you simply clicked in the middle to go forward and clicked left and right to go sideways. It didn't occur to me that you could drop the buttons, drop the interface in front of you. And um, you see that on some of the adventure games. On the, uh, you see that on the iPhone in spades, this sort of transparent interface, um, whether it be um, the uh, Angry Birds pulling back on the, uh, pulling back on the catapult or um, uh, games where you swipe fruit to slice fruit. That transparent interface, Cyan sort of was the first people to do that, and they did that on the Mac in 19... Uh, 88. And, and that was impressive. So yeah, I was in love with the Mac because it was new and different. I did two games in the Mac. I did the Pyramid Apparel and then I did the Unfortunate. Not everyone has, now all my luck has been good. I did a game called Mac Challenger, the Space Shuttle Flight Simulator, which was the first Mac Flight Simulator. And um, that's unfortunate. Um, Aegis was doing a lot of uh, video effects programs for the uh, Amiga. And when I came in the day of the Challenger explosion, I thought they had actually staged a prank on me because they were capable of doing it. They were that good with video. They had all video editing decks and all that. So I thought they had actually staged the accident for the first couple of minutes. I thought it was a lavish ruse to, to uh, play a practical joke on me. And then I found out what had happened and I was horrified. So, um, and there's a whole discussion on the Challenger disaster that could take an hour. But, um, so we had to pull it off the market. But um, the Pyramid of Peril, I still play. It's still a good game. Um, Pyramid of Peril is still an actual playable, fun, challenging as hell game, and it still works. I can run an emulator, and I can play the Pyramid of Peril. I've not been able to find a way of playing uh, Mac Challenger, because I think Mac Challenger, if I remember correctly, I played very fast and loose with the hardware. I used some tricks 
that were kind of undocumented to get a double buffered display going on the uh, original Mac. So there you go. And you did the yeah. whole game in 30 days, right? Pyramid Apparel was 30 days from conception to heat shrink. I was at another company. I wanted to do the Mac. I had the Voyager thing memorized. I knew how Voyager worked, the Voyager game. I knew how the random level generation worked and all that. Um, we had to actually conjure a development system because back then, in order to develop for the Mac the official way, you bought a Lisa for $9,000 and you ran Pascal and you built the Pascal app. There was a fourth, which I remember I'd learned back in, back in the Atari days, called Mac Forth that worked very well. And we started building in Mac Forth, but at that time, the people doing Mac Forth were transitioning and there was no way you could publish the product in Mac Forth at that very moment. We were trying to make the first Mac World show. So we had to pick up another guy who had a fourth that he was just starting on the Mac and help him finish it. And he did some cool tricks that made it possible to write programs for the 128K Mac. They're very small. And that was cool because the 128K Mac was a very low amount of memory. He actually used half of the memory for code and half the memory for data and used 16-bit addresses. So you were actually addressing only 64K, but you were addressing 64K for data and 64K for code. And it was brilliant because it saved... It's, it, it, it had the size of every address, so it was perfect. And yeah, Pyramid Parallel was done. I had people helping me with the writing. I had people helping me with the graphics, people helping me with the music. And it was done in, we were literally the night before Macworld, we're in David Barrett's Marina Del Rey apartment building, duping this and shrink wrapping boxes. We bought these generic plastic boxes. We sh shoved in the printed sheets of the Pyramid Parallel cover. We put the disc in, and we then drove down. The next morning, we drew, drove all the way to San Francisco from L.A. and set up a booth at Macworld. And in fact, if you look at the video of Macworld that's out there on the YouTube, the first Macworld show, there's a video of it, you can see the opening screen of Pyramid Peril in that video. It was cool. You know, it was fun. Well, it's like 1992 was a big year for you, right? We've got Rodney's Fun Screen. Yeah. Uh, the Leather, God Leather Goddesses of Phobos 2, Gas Pump. <laughs> Girls meet the pulsating inconvenience. <laughs> Planet X. Uh, oh man, what a what a jump! That game was, that game was done. <laughs> Another boss too. Everyone hates it because it's too simple, too easy. But that game was done in the midst of a bankruptcy, and literally the way the game was done is we had a guy who could draw with pens on paper very nicely, colored drawings. So the whole game was drawn on paper, scanned in, and put into the game. Now, what had happened was in 88, when we got the manhole from Cyan and we published it, we wanted to put on DOS and we wanted to put the CD-ROM and stuff in Japan. I had been working at Aegis on an adventure game system that was similar to Zill, an Infocom system, but more graphical. And we took that and we created something called MAID. And it was like a scheme language, a Lisp-like language that ran in a very small address space, a very small space. I think the core language was 26 kilobytes. And we were able to build, eventually, Return to Zorak, the full thing with the video playback and the compressed audio and all that stuff and run on a, on a uh, one megabyte PC. Um, and we built that originally for the manhole, and then we used it for a whole slew of games, including Rodney's Fun Screen, including the Richest Scary titles, which had a life of three weeks in the, in the stores, which is a story, too. And um, we did stuff for the Tandy Viz, which no one knows about. Tandy... This is the first Microsoft video game machine that no one wants to remember, a horrible machine. And then we did something called the FM Towns in, in Japan, the Fujitsu FM Towns. And that was like the greatest meeting of my life because Manhole was out in the United States getting a lot of press. We go to Japan and I'm with a guy named Paul Kohler and we're about to meet with Fujitsu who has this beautiful FM Towns machine. This machine... 1990 was hot. It had 32,000 colors. It was gorgeous. CD-ROM machine. And I go to him, let's ask for half a million dollars. And he goes to me, Bill, they only have 80,000 machines out there. You can't ask for half a million dollars. And go, I've read about Japan. I know their game. It's all about prestige. We're going to tell them this title will make them look great. So we ask for half a million dollars. You get $400,000 to build the game for the FM Towns. Years later, I worked with a guy named Wayne Holder, who had done uh, Dungeon Master. With a D and he had sold it to um, Fujitsu for $200,000. And when I told him this, he goes, you 
faster. How did you get 400 pounds? Because they wanted it. And I could remember going to a store in Kyoto and seeing the manhole. And they had a beautiful box. And what we did there is we hired a Japanese puppet troupe to do all the Japanese voices. And we did Japanese text by using Japanese Max, which had kanji. And we had Japanese Max create all the kanji. And we converted it to graphics. And all the text was done as graphics for the CD-ROM version. So we had Japanese, English, text, and audio that could be switched back and forth, which is why we did deals. So that engine, the made engine, kept moving along. Lever Goss of Phobos 2 was designed by Moretzky, was designed to be funny, quick game. And in fact, if LGBO2 had come out, let's say, on the iPhone, when the iPhone first shipped, it probably would have been successful because it was exactly the kind of thing that people love. Quick, stupid, fun game. Um, there, are, there are Easter eggs that almost no one has ever found in that game that one day people will find, maybe archivists will find. But it was a fun game that got panned. So, when we did Return to Zork, Lever Goddesses of Phobos made Return to Zork because what happened is when we did Return to Zork, we were so angry about the reviews of Lever Goddess. Too easy? We'll show you. We'll make this game impossible. <laughs> so we made Return to Zork impossible. We made the game so hard to play, puzzles so unfair and so cruel, I still get hate mail about it. Like um, the bonding plant. First puzzle you come to, there's a plant in the ground near the sign. You can pull it out of the ground. You can shovel it out of the ground. You pull it out of the ground, you get no indications of anything wrong, other than the fact that after you go back to your inventory for a while, the plan is dead. Hours and hours later, you find that you've totally ruined the game. You're dead. You have to go back to the beginning and restart the game because you killed the bonding plan. And that was true throughout the entire game. The bog puzzle used the same code as Voyager. It was a randomly generated bog, and Activision actually made me take it out. They made me make the bog fix. Because when the bog was randomly generated, the idea is the bog is shifting and all that, players would basically kill themselves because there was no way they could use a cheat sheet to play the game. So we had to actually lock the bog down. But the things like the sliding stone puzzle, you know, where you have a, a 12 puzzle, the classic 12 puzzle sliding piece with two sets of words and tile that spell a word, things like the bra box. The bra box was my idea. It was stupid, but it was, it was literally insane. This guy is yelling because he's a, someone delivered a bra to his house. He doesn't want it. He doesn't need it. Later on, you have to take that bra box, put it in the incinerator the right way so you don't blow up the incinerator. Then you have to put it in water. Then you use it to pick up a lock. Or the rats in the motorboat, you know, the, the motorboat powered by rats, or, um, and so on and so on. Sounds like my Every, kind of motorboat there. Everything in that game was basically, so much of that game was basically, we thought we were going out of business because we were in Chapter 11. We didn't know what was going to happen with Activision. We were upset about the reviews of Lever Goddesses. And so we decided to have fun and just make the most ridiculous, insane puzzle game, adventure game ever made. And, it, and even though there are much better games, Monkey Island is by far a better game, I think, than Return to Zork. Return to Zork does have distinction of having the most unfair, cruel, and unnecessary puzzle play of any game ever released. And it will live forever because of that nonsense. It is insane. And, and it also had the cleverest interface. You had, A, any scene you were at, you could take a picture of that scene. Later on, you could ask any character about that scene. B, every conversation was recorded on a tape recorder, virtual tape recorder, so you could ask any character about what anything anyone has ever seen said. You could also uh, ask them about any object you had. And when you talk to characters, you could express your emotions. It just was a rich game. And, and one of the reasons why I'm so impressed with The Last of Us is it is the first time in 20 years I've seen a game that has really rich character-to-character -character interactions. The interactions between the girl and, and the lead adventurer is unbelievably rich. And it's something I really wanted to see happen in Return to Zork, and we tried really hard. Um, so that was that, and the engine was used for a while, and then um, uh, the big question is, why was it such a stupid idiot, and why did I leave Activision? It's really a couple things. One, I had young children and I was offered a position at this big educational software company that was going to change education in America, and it seemed like a really good quest. Two, there was creative differences to myself and some of the people at Activision who actually left Activision soon after I left. But uh, a lot of people believed that Myst was the future of adventure games, and this is an awesome title, but Myst wasn't as rich in terms of puzzle play, and I wanted to go in that other direction with richer puzzles, with that diamond interface and all that. So I sort of lost that argument 
and uh, we had a product under development. We had the Planetfall reboot. We were working on Planetfall with Floyd the Robot as the next adventure game, Eddie Dumbrower, myself, and all, Joe Asprin, all these great people, and Activision didn't want to do that, and so I had this insane offer to go to San Diego to do educational games, and we eventually did 100 educational adventures, quote-unquote, and I felt that that was going to be a big success, and in retrospect, mm, probably should have stayed at Activision, because Activision turned into a pretty neat company. In fact, one of the people I worked with at Aegis, when he was a high school student, we carded him at Aegis, and then he followed me to Activision, and he had a career spanning Sega and a couple other companies. His name's Steve Ackridge. Is now the, v, is now the head of production for, Act, for Activision, and he's actually responsible now for the uh, Call of Duty franchise. So he was there when I was there, and I think he has a, a very cool position there, and he does good stuff. So, um, so maybe I regret leaving Activision, but I did what I did. What do you think about the transition from the text parsers of those games to this graphical interface? Well, the whole point of, of Return of Zork was to bring back the revert, the parser in the sense of a reverse parser. We knew that text adventure games were richer. I, I, I gave a talk called the uh, Interfaces of the Game at, at the, um, at the at, uh, Game Developer Conference in um, 1994. And what I said was with text adventure, you know, you see a mailbox and you could say, speak to the mailbox. And if the game supported that, it could say, the mailbox is really an alien. And he starts talking to you. You could do stuff like that with text parsers. The richness was so there. Quite often they didn't live up to that. But, you know, Infocom did a magnificent job on Hitchhikers and all the Zorks and stuff. They were rich games. And I have actually uh, the uh, Lost Treasures of Infocom on my iPhone. And I play it sometimes when I'm in the airports. What we try to do with Return to Zork is bring that back by having this reverse parser. You have an object or you don't have an object. Click on an object or you click on a character. And we bring up all the verbs all at once so you can actually see what happens. We're trying to bring back that richness. And that was a big creative argument. I felt that we needed to continue that direction and get the richness of text adventures uh, in a graphical interface. Um, and I, I would love to see, which I haven't seen right now, it'd be very, very cool on the iPhone to have an adventure game where you had this sort of tactile interface for objects and stuff, but when you met a character, you used to talk to them. The, the, their Siri why couldn't you just actually natural voice talk to the character and get information? One of the, this may sound crazy, but I'm very disappointed in the entire um, Assassin's Creed series for only one reason. It's a great game, fantastic physics, fantastic graphics, but what kills me is it starts out like, Mr. Phelps, this is your mission, so you choose to accept it. They hand you what you're supposed to do right then and there. You know, you, you start the game, you're in this world, and you meet someone, they tell you exactly what to do. You're going to have to go and assassinate this person, you have to do this, right? If they hadn't made that so you actually had to discover what to do, those things would have been awesome adventure games. If you actually had to interact with a bunch of characters and cajole out of them or to discern from what was going on around there who the really bad guy was, particularly if you had used, like, sort of, um, you know, the, uh, the famous... Um, Hero's Journey, uh, Joseph Campbell, you know, if you had basically a switcheroo where it'd be really cool to have an Assassin's Creed type game where you talk to people and you figure out that this person is the bad person and just about the time you're about to do something, you find out that that's not the case at all. Like, you know, oh no, they're not the bad person, they're the good person. The bad person is this person. You've been deceived. That would be an awesome plot twist. That would be a really good twist. And you don't, like, like one of the greatest things is in, um, greatest moments in new modern game history. It's the first emotional moment since Planet, since Station Fall. I think Station Fall or Planet Fall, one of them, you have to kill your robot companion in order to win. And it's a very emotional moment. It was actually, for years, people say, that's the only emotional moment in a game. Well, in um, The Walking Dead, um, there is a, the adventure game, there is an emotional moment at the end of the game, which I will not tell you, uh, but it's the only time I've seen a very moving emotional moment because they play that game. They, they, they get into a situation, it's an adventure game, they get into a situation where something happens and you have to do something you really don't want to do, but you have to do it. And uh, it's, it's gut-wrenching. And, and games can be like that. You know, like the original Electronic Arts advertisement, can a game make you cry? And the answer is yeah. And I think, um, I think the... Um, the, 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 Twilight, the uh, Floyd game made you Clyde to some extent, and I think um, the Walking Dead adventure game has that incredibly moving thing at the end that's just 
Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So yeah, yeah. Text games, text games were rich, and and I and there's a whole active community creating them. What I I want to do years from now, I don't know when I'll get to do it because right now it's like uh, Jeff Tunnell said, the the uh, the app store is a hellish world in terms of trying to make a living doing it. So I have to focus on what I have to do. But down the road, if I were to go back to adventure games, what I would try to do is find something that the interface just goes away. You're not even worried about it. It just feels completely natural. They did a good job with um, The Walking Dead. And The Last of Us, even though it's a first-person shooter, you know, has a sort of natural feel to it as well. I'd love to see how that could go, how far you could go with that. So you have this rich story being unreal to you, but you have this great puzzle play as well. Maybe MacGyver-like things. I talk about this all the time, like the MacGyver TV show. If you had a real physics engine and the puzzles were actually real physics puzzles, like how do I get that door open or how do I get up to that part, that could be extremely interesting if tied into a good, good, good narrative. Yeah. Maybe you can take it to Kickstarter. Yeah, well, I always said to uh, people that if, uh, if I had to do a Kickstarter, I probably would do that. <coughs> well, I, would, I would basically show scenes and return to Zork and say, wouldn't you like adventure games to be this rich again? You know, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I'm not going to do that. Um, we have, you know, with what we're doing now, we have spent so much time on the iPhone. We, you know, it's been six years for us on the iPhone. And we have lived the app market so much. We're sort of like, we know it really well. We've had some successes, and we know it extraordinarily well. It's extraordinarily difficult. It's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. We haven't had a random multi-million success. We just had successes. But um, now we understand it better than we ever have, and we want to take advantage of that expertise. Um, it's a cool platform, and I think the next set of innovations in, this, in these platforms, the Android, the Apple, iOS, it's going to be interesting. And I actually am worried that the console world is going to have interesting difficulties with the next generation. Um, Microsoft did a bad job at E3. They may come back from that. I played the PS4, it's beautiful, but is it as much of an improvement over the PS3 as the PS3 was over the PS2, over the PS2 was over the PS1? Probably not. And so that's a difficult sell. And, and once they go to digital distribution, you know, all the pressure is going to be on these companies to basically do what Apple did eventually. They're eventually, you know, the error of selling this may go away, may go away. There will always be top-notch titles, but once this goes digital, and once it, uh, the markets open up, you can have the same race to the bottom. I mean, if Apple had a price tag, right now, Apple has free apps and paid apps. If Apple didn't have free apps, and the, and the minimum price of apps was 99 cents, I think people would be better off. But people are now so conditioned to free apps, it, in many ways, people are actually paying people to get their apps. By that, I mean a large number of apps are sold, free apps are sold by basically telling people, download my free app, and I will give you currency in this game. So you're playing uh, Clash of Clans, which is a free game that has currency in the game, and, so, and an ad will come up, or a way, something will come up that says, if you download our free app, please, we'll give you this much coinage for Clash of Clans. People are actually paying people to download apps. And, what, and, and, and remember, business-wise, this is a little complicated. A lot of this is delivered is being driven by the venture capital that's flowed into the industry. So companies have funded mobile companies, and the mobile companies want to succeed, so they're spending money to promote their apps. So basically, people are getting apps for less than free. They're getting them for they're getting paid to download apps by this company scrambling for position. And I think Jeff Tanell is spot on when he realizes this is a very difficult and scary model. I'm with him. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I will uh, hopefully be here next week, but don't be surprised if I'm not. The semester will be starting in a couple of weeks, and I'm sort of struggling to get all the uh, prep work done for that. So if I'm not here next week, you'll know why. Sitting uh, down with a big pile of books trying to figure out my syllabus and uh, such as that. But hopefully, though, I'll still be able to put out an episode. In any case, I will have a uh, have an audio podcast with the uh, the guys that did Heroes, the uh, History of Sierra, Dr. 
documentary project. Uh, the Kickstarter didn't make it, but I still got a great interview with these guys, and I think you'll like to hear it. A lot of great stuff there for fans of Sierra. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, oh yeah, as always, thank you very much. If you have supported the show, it really means a lot to me, guys. You're keeping these episodes coming. If you like interviews with people like Bill Volk, where else are you going to get them? Uh, so please go to armchairarcade.com, look for the match hat link in the top right corner of the page. It takes about uh, five to ten seconds to set this up. Uh, even faster if you've already got a PayPal account, you just make a few clicks and uh, you can subscribe for a dollar a week, dollar a month, or whatever, guys. Uh, doesn't sound like much, but it really makes a big difference. And thank you to everyone who has already done that. Thanks. All right, now, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I've got another sort of fancy uh, microbrewed uh, root beer. Uh, this is uh, Virgil's microbrewed uh, natural ingredients root, root beer, so pure, so rich and creamy, you'll swear it's made in heaven. And they've even got the apostrophe in the word it's there, so I'm very, uh, very excited to see that. Uh, let's see, spices, herbs from. Anise, licorice, vanilla, bourbon, cinnamon, clove, wintergreen, sweet birch, molasses, nutmeg, pimento, berry oil, balsam oil, and oil of cassia. Cassia, cassia, not really sure how to pronounce that. This is out of uh, Los Angeles. A uh, pretty cool bottle here. Uh, kind of caught my eye. Uh, anyway, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Virgil's root beer here in the... Rather excellent drinking horn, trying to decide if I can tell any difference between this and an A&W <laughs> or IBC or, or what's the other one, mugs. You definitely could smell, uh, I think the, the herbs in this, the anise in particular, kind of a little bit uh, more pronounced. You know, it, it smells fresher uh, than those other drinks that have probably been, uh, you know, made brewed by the in huge uh, thousand gallon vats or whatever. You know, this definitely has more of a home brewed, uh, micro brewed type of... Uh, Aroma to it. it smells like root beer that you'd make at home if you ever done that. It's kind of fun. Anyway, um, let's give this a taste. <sighs> wow, you can definitely tell this is def. <laughs> this is not A and W or mugs here. Um, a lot of uh, flavor packed into this. You get definitely can uh, taste that anise, which is one of my favorite. Uh, is it a spice, an herb, or whatever it is? I really like that flavor. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of got a bit of a caramel-like like taste to it. I guess that must be the molasses that I'm, I'm tasting there. A uh, very, uh, definitely creamy, thick, uh, really nice uh, root beer. You, you wouldn't want to spoil this with putting ice cream in it and stuff like this. It's definitely something you just want to uh, kind of savor all the, uh, the flavor going on here. Let me try it one more time. Uh, yeah, definitely very tasty. And it does, doesn't taste like... Uh, other root beers that I've had before. Actually quite nice. It's not quite as sweet as those other brands either. Instead of the, that sort of rush of sugar, uh, with this you're getting a lot of different kinds of flavors. You're tasting uh, molasses. I taste the, the, the anise there. I figure out what else they had in there. Cl uh, clove, I think. Some other ingredients. But anyway, very, very nice. If you're at all a fan of root beer, I think you should definitely uh, give this a, a taste. Or if you don't like beer, but you still want to try something uh, fancy, uh, here we go. Virgil's root beer. I'm going to give this uh, a full five out of five drinking horns, actually. Uh, very, very nice. Very well done. And it's, a, at least here in Minnesota, fairly, uh, you can find it in several different places. The if you look at the in the grocery stores sort of uh, specialty sections, you can find this. So, anyway, Virgil's root beer highly recommended. Okay, let's wrap this up uh, with a quotation. And for the quotation, I found a little something from uh, MacGyver, and it goes something like this: When something's broken, the easiest thing is to throw it away, forget about it. But if you just step back and take a look at what you've got, you find a totally different way for it to work. See you guys next week. Want some raw? Of course you do.